Shall we gather at the river where bright angels lead us from? With its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful. Oh, God. 
Well, good evening, everyone. Yeah, nice, nice crowd in the auditorium this evening. I like this. This is wonderful. It's many more people than I spoke to this morning, and that's a little unfortunate, but we work together and we, we try as hard as we can. Tonight, I want to I want to move a little bit. Uh, I've I've uh, been studying a lot in the book of Proverbs lately because I think one of the things that we are so lacking in our society today is wisdom. And what better book to learn about wisdom from than the book of Proverbs. But tonight I wanna to look at uh, the New Testament and I wanna to go to the book of John and I wanna go specifically to John 8 verse 12 where Jesus makes a, a remarkable claim. The Gospel of John records at least seven remarkable claims. Let me adjust the camera there so you guys can hopefully see me a little bit better. He makes, uh, as I said, at least seven remarkable claims. He begins by calling himself the bread of life in John 6 verse 48. Here in John 8, verse 12, he says he is the light of the world. In John 10, verse 9, he says, I am the door. In John 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. In John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And of course, in John 15, 5, I am the vine. By making such statements, Jesus reveals much about the world around us and the lives that we live. And it also makes, reveals much about himself and what he has to offer us. In this study tonight, I wanna to focus our attention on his claim from John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He tells us, or it, it reads from the New King James Version. It says, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Light of the world. I know Brenda's already heard this once and she's she's going to hear it again tonight at toward the end of this sermon tonight but I was emailed a a poem and I'm going to read that poem at the end of this service and and make a few comments on it but the light of the world what an amazing thing we we do everything what would what would this world be like without light can you imagine that? If we had no light, if there was no sunshine, if there was no moon at night, if there were no stars in the skies, what would, what would, would be light awesome. be like on this planet? You know, for one thing, we wouldn't need our eyes, would we? Because there would be nothing to see. It is light that allows us to view all the beauty of this planet around us. The plants that grow in the spring and summer, the leaves that change colors as fall and autumn strike us. 
beauties around us all over. Jesus says he is the light of the world. Made by Jesus in the treasury of the temple, part of the court, a woman, in which there were two colossal golden lampstands on which hung a multitude of lamps, lighting, uh, lighted after the evening uh, sacrifice, probably during evening, uh, probably every evening during the Feast of Tabernacles. Diffusing their brilliance, it is said, all over the city. We examine the words of Jesus, or as we examine the words of Jesus, we're going to notice what is implied about the world we live in. First and foremost, it implies in this world there is darkness. If Jesus is going to make the claim that he's the light, then you know what? We, we live in a world where there is darkness. The, symbol of, the symbolism of darkness used metaphorically here to symbolize distress, mourning, perplexity, ignorance, and even death. It is used figuratively of moral depravity. Darkness pervades our society at almost every level. If we were to look at the reality of darkness, we would see darkness on a daily basis. All we have to do is turn on the evening news and we see terrorism, war, oppression, sexual abuse, greed, and the list just goes on and on and on. It, is, it amazes me when you look at the history of man, how much time and effort is made in spending trying to come up with contraptions on how can I inflict pain or suffering on my fellow man? The experiments that went on in Germany in World War II are horrendous. I'm not even gonna go into the list of what they are tonight because it, it would, it's, it's not a proper place to bring it up. Just inhuman, the things that they would think of. We view it in the media through pornography, through filthy language. I, I did an experiment as I prepared for this evening. It used to be when I was growing up, every single TV program had a seal of approval that they would broadcast before each show. It was a seal of approval that showed that the, the content was wholesome. There was not excessive violence. There was not excessive language, nothing. The use of that seal went out in 1983. They no longer use it. Since 1983, even in broadcast TV, there's untold violence and horrible language. It's, it's you realize how hard it is for a movie to get even to an R rating nowadays, it's horrible because we allow so much every day to come into our homes, into our lives. As described in Ephesians 4, 17, let's go ahead and turn over there and read that. I wanna read what Paul describes here. It says, this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Paul describes how many of us today walk in darkness and we do it without even realizing it. It is in the futility of their minds. It is a darkening of their understanding, alienated from the life of God. What is God? God is light. There is no darkness in God. 
He is the source of all light. You're not going to find any of these things in God. You're not going to find any futility of mind. You're not going to find any darkening of understanding. God is light. As pure as can be, he is the source of that light. These people here are ignorant because of the blindness of their hearts, past feeling, given over to lewdness, working all uncleanness with greediness. And I can say that because really, I, I know I mentioned the word pornography earlier today, but did you realize that's one of the top three uh, revenue producers for the internet, pornography? unbelievable the things that go on in this world but jesus jesus proclaims here in john 8 verse 12 that he is the light of the world and in him there is no darkness it is a claim made elsewhere in the gospels it's made in john 1 4 through 9 uh it is made by jesus on other occasions if we were to go and see them we'd see that he makes the same claim in john 9 verse 5 John 12, verse 35, and also in verse 46. He is the light of the world. He's not making an idle claim. This is the truth. He is the light, not a light. And when we make that distinction, we have to realize, you know, if you are the, the source of light, what shadow will be found in you? None. We stand here on this planet of ours and when we, we look at the sun and we look at that as, as a form of light, guess what? When that sunlight hits us, it leaves a shadow behind us because we're not the source of that light. The sun is. But in God, he is the source. There's no shadow, no turning. Indicating here that he alone provides true light. In John 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the one, one true source of light, and even as he alone provides the true living way for us to find eternal life. As the light, Jesus is the source of life. It is, he is the source of an abundant life with peace, joy, and love. He is the source of eternal life, including the resurrection. In John eleven twenty five, 25, it reads, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though, they, though he may die, he shall live. He's the source of everything. He is where we need to turn. We must be wary of those who proclaim to offer light. And what do I mean by that? Let's, let's turn over here to 2 Corinthians 11. In 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 13, it says, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder... For Satan himself transforms, uh, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into minutes, ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Satan is a great deceiver. The things he offers on the surface look pretty good. 
But when we finally look deeper into them, we find that it's not an offer at all. It's a trap. Oh, you gotta figure out where I just left off. At best, one can only reflect what light Jesus has already bestowed. So we need to understand that. Jesus is the source that we need to look for. Of the world, not only for the Jews only, but for the Gentiles. Jesus is the light, not of the Jews, not of the Gentiles, but he is the light of the world. He's the light for me. He's the light for you. He's the light for everyone. This has been foretold by the prophets in Isaiah 49, 6. And also it is told of through his apostles in Acts 26. In Acts 26, uh, 15 through 18, we can read, so I say, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which I have seen and of all the things which I have yet revealed to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people and as well from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus is that light to all who believe in him and to all who follow him. How wonderful to know that in a world of darkness, we can have the light of life through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Yet we should reiterate that he is truly the light, the one true light. He is the true light for those who follow him by becoming disciples. Note the connection between following Jesus and being a disciple. The, the word disciple means follower, learner. Only those who follow him will have the light of life. Therefore, only those who become his disciples will walk in his light. One becomes a, a, a disciple or a follower of Jesus by beginning with faith. Because without faith, we have no foundation to build off of. So we need to start there. Not only does it start with faith, but it also includes such things as baptism. So many people in our world today get that wrong. They think, oh, it's optional. You can do it if you want to. But that's not what Jesus tells us. Jesus is also the light to those who abide in his word. Only by abiding in his word are we truly disciples. disciples. Do we truly have Christ? As we abide in his word, we not only walk in life, we become light. Reflecting the light of Christ. Proving what is acceptable, ex exposing that which is not. The light of the world brings glory to our Father in heaven. That's an amazing statement. Now, what I as I as I begin to wrap up this lesson, I know I'm a little bit early, but I've, I've got a little bit of time. What I wanted to do, and and I and I read this this morning in in uh, in displays. I received a, an email. And boy, I tell you, it was it was from my my friend that uh, uh, I worked with last year in Chile. So I had to I had to go.
go through the hassle of translating all of it because it's all in Spanish. But he, he sent me a, he sent me a poem. It's a poem by Marianne Williamson. And it was read by, Mel, by Nelson Mandela at his inauguration speech as president elect of South Africa in 1994. And as I read through this poem, I thought initially of two things. Number one, I thought initially of John 8 verse 12. But I also thought of a trip that Brenda and I took with our kids down to Mammoth Cave. So let me go ahead and read this poem real quick. It's, it's, it's not long, it's, it's pretty short. It reads, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful without limit. It is our light, not the darkness, that scares us the most. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are we not to be? You are a child of the universe. Playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightening or shrinking so other people around you do not feel insecure. We are born to make manifest the glory of the universe that is in us. Not just some of us, it is within each and every one. And while we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. Now in light of that, Let's go back up here and read John 8, 12 one more time. If I can scroll back up to the top here. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Many years ago, Brenda and I took our kids down to Mammoth Cave. And in one of the tours that we took, we, we've actually been down there a couple of times and we've taken several of the tours. Uh, but in one of the tours, what they do is they, they usher a, a large group of people into a very large cavern. It is a cavern that's probably three or four times the size of this building. It's huge. And they usher everybody into the center of the room and you're, you're marveling at all the lights and the, the stalactites. You, know, you, can, you can tell the difference between a stalactite and a stalagmite. The reason, the, and, and the way you tell the difference is a stalactite is the one that points down. It's because it, it holds tight to the ceiling. And a stalagmite is growing up from the floor because it might eventually get to the ceiling. So that's, that's a, a way to remember which one is which. However, they walk you into this room, they gather everybody in the center of the room and they turn out the lights. Oh my, I have never in my life felt darkness as dark as that. It is a darkness that is so complete that you, you not only just realize you don't see anything, you, it, you can actually begin to feel it. And it's almost like a heavy blanket that weighs you down and it's just powerful. And it seems almost like nothing can overcome this. And then the guide in the center of this large cavern lights a single candle, just one. One tiny candle in this huge cavern and all of those rock formations and the colors of the rock and all of it all becomes visible again. 
And what it helps me to realize is really, even though that darkness felt so strong and it felt so powerful, one little tiny light was able to overcome all that darkness. And we are to let our light shine, aren't we, as Christians? We may seem, we may look at the news every night. We may, we may think that we are just so far outnumbered that there's nothing we can do and the world is lost and oh, woe is me. But one little candle, one little tiny light made that cavern so you could see everything. You could see the people around you. You could see the walls of the cavern. You could see the, the ceiling of the cavern. You could see everything. And we need to be that light. We need to let our light shine no matter what. We may think it's the darkest that we've ever seen it, but you know what? We can overcome because we have Jesus, the light of the world. And there is no light more powerful than him. This evening, if you need to respond to the invitation, then I would ask that you come while we stand and while we sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He shares on our way. When you choose goodwill, He abides with us still, and with all we will trust and obey. Trust and obey.
not sure if you're aware, Wednesday evenings, oh, wait, you've joined us on Wednesday evenings, right, I believe, in, in the book of John. And, you know, the Christ does give himself so many different titles as we see throughout, and we see all the different signs that he is given, and akin to even what Brother Job had mentioned this morning, where you can show people the truth and lead them all the way through, and they even agree with the truth, but still refuse to obey the truth. And all the people throughout the book of John who witnessed Christ himself performing these signs and just fell away. And, you know, you having started us off in the book of Proverbs and, you know, we as Christians, we want that wisdom so much. It helps us separate out the things from the world. And talking about the t TV and the things that we see on there, Brother Baki and I have talked about many times where we've watched these movies that we had seen on TV year in years past, and we'll watch like a DVD of it. And how much language is actually in there that was filtered out on TV because you weren't allowed to say these things. And what gets, it just bears, it just wears us down, constantly being bombarded by it. You know, being able to try to be that reflection of light that God is, and we have that opportunity as Christians, having been made in his image and wanting to be like him, we can be a shining light, a reflection of it. But when that stuff creeps into our lives through pop, popular culture, media and everything, it starts to dull it. And we find ourselves not shining so brightly anymore. It really is up to us to follow the wisdom that God provides us to know what is good and what isn't, where to turn to, and what to stay away from. Um, so thank you very much for those reminders. Uh, you know, we do, we do have a lot of things in this world that are beautiful and things that God gave us in this hundredfold life that we can absolutely enjoy. Uh, yeah. Mammoth Cave is just one of the millions of things of awesome example of his awesome creation. There's no reason for all the other garbage that's out there. So thank you again for that reminder and you know, how important it is to watch what we put into our uh, bodies through all of our five senses. Um, I know we have Saturday, heart diseases and their cure coming up. Uh, it will be an introductory class. Again, it'll be st starting Saturday the 17th, 10 a.m. to noon, every other week, forever. <laughs> uh, if you want to keep on going through it, feel free. You know, um, the idea is, again, it will keep going in perpetuity because we know that people will kind of join us onto it halfway through and want to keep going through it. Uh, we will try, perhaps, those of us who are here and still have energy after the class, because we'll be geared up to go, uh, possibly to get some work done around the uh, property. Um, you know, if we can't do much, whether it doesn't work out well, we'll, we'll schedule another day. Um, anything else? Any other reminders? Okay. We have on the docket, Brother Philip Short is meant to close us out tonight. Uh, Brother Philip Short, I see him online. Give me one second. I'm going to put you up on the screen. I'm also going to give you the ability to unmute yourself. Count to about 15 and you'll be good to go. All right, go ahead, please. Um, please lead us in a closing prayer. All right. Shall we pray? Dear Holy Father, I thank you for this time tonight to learn more about you, Lord. I pray that you will help us to take what we learned tonight and apply it to our lives, Lord, so that we can grow closer to you, Lord, and hopefully bring others to you, Lord. I pray that you will protect those who attended service tonight as they go home and that you will help them to return so that we can fellowship with you again, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, 
Emily. Thank you, Brother Short. And other Brother Short, I'll call you in just a little bit, okay? Okay, good, good. Fantastic, thank you. All right, I'm gonna give you all, and I apologize again once more to those on Zoom for having missed the, um, having missed the slides in the beginning. All right. You know, if it wouldn't have been for that, I wouldn't have realized that 